On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, is it time for the Thunder to give up on Gordon Hayward? You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. get it going on the Lockdown Thunder podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member and beat writer for InsideTheThunder.com, Rylan Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. On today's show, we're diving into the Oklahoma City Thunder falling in Boston as the Celtics just beat up on the Thunder. Is it time for the Thunder to move on from Gordon Hayward. Josh Giddy continues to play well, as does Isaiah Joe. What to make of this interesting road trip? Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $250 in bonus bets with the winning of any $5 bet. That's $250 if your bet wins just by visiting FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So the Thunder did not have SGA in this game. They did not have J-Dub in this game versus a fully loaded Celtics team. And of course, if you've listened to this show, you know that there's one thing we're not going to do, and that's overreact to one game. We really try to stay big picture oriented, and we have done that throughout this season through the highs and whatever lows that there have been. And this was a game without SJ and J-Dub. So it's a game where you automatically should not jump to too many conclusions. But that's part of the problem when you're evaluating Gordon Hayward. There was no one else to be aggressive tonight. There was no one to get in the way of. And so I get the, the concerns about finding your fit offensively, about gelling with this team. But should there have ever been a night for Gordon Hayward to really you know, step forward and take a few shots, it was tonight. I want to preface this conversation of if it's too soon or if the Thunder should you know, give up on Gordon Hayward with, I stand by that being a good trade. The trade was no risk, high reward. I would do that trade over again this second. It's just that you're not going to walk out of the casino with a payout. You're not going to lose any money. You got to have a free play for the day. Because Trey Mann and Vasily Micic and Dallas Bertans, while they were fan favorite players, two of the three, they were not going to be playoff players. And Gordon Hayward at least had or still has a shot to be a playoff player. And ideally, Gordon Hayward was going to be the shot making play finishing, floor spacing, team defender. And surprisingly enough, he's only checked one of those boxes and it's been on the defensive end. He's been more than a passable team defender if you got anything from him offensively. And in the last two nights, you've seen him be hit with two 24-second shot clock violations, which I think perfectly sums up his OKC tenure to this point because either he's unaware or just doesn't want to shoot the basketball. That's what it comes down to. 0 for 4 in a game in which you don't have SGA, you don't have JW, you get four shots. He's shooting over 50% from three, but he only takes 24 of them in Oklahoma City. And he's shown flashes with the thunder of of him being more aggressive off the catch and him looking to score more. But that's been few and far between. That's been in very limited minutes. Like that Houston game. If you go back and watch that Houston game, it will jump out at you how aggressive Gordon Hayward is being, but that's not been the, the, the sum total for him this season with the thunder. Now, you have six games to go. And if you want to spend these six games trying to ignite something on offense, I actually agree with that to an extent. Because I believe that 
Aaron Wiggins is a guy who, who you can count on no matter if you don't play him for a week straight or you start him for a month straight. You can count on him being the same guy giving you that positive winning impact. So if you want to spin these six games and say, but if we can get Gordon Hayward going, it, it benefits the Thunder in the long run. I totally get that. Because I think that even after those six games and, and come playoff time, you put Wiggins in that in that spot, in that, in that minute allotment, like many fans want the Thunder to do, then you're still going to be fine. So, so maybe you don't put the kids to bed yet, but you start warming the milk on the Gordon Hayward tenure in Oklahoma City. Because if, if he continues to look like this, if he continues to look the way he has since the trade, you have the starting five, then you have Isaiah Joe, Aaron Wiggins, Kaysen Wallace, Kenrich Williams, and Jalen Williams that you'd rather have minutes you know, being allotted to than Gordon Hayward. That's 10 players right there. And if you want to argue, you know, maybe Gordon Hayward, you know, but in certain matchups, even if he's just out there, uh, you know, running up and down the floor, being a team defender, uh, at least he does have some shot gravity that helps you uh, more than Jay Will does in certain matchups. That's still nine players who you would rather have out on the court. So take these six games and, and, and kind of do what you want with them, honestly. You know, the biggest thing will be getting SGA and J Dub healthy. And if you want to spend that time seeing if Gordon Hayward can come around, I don't see a problem with that because, again, you're still in that no-risk category. But come playoff time, the conversation will and have to be different with Gordon Hayward. You can no longer just throw him out there if he's playing like this. This is not good enough. And you have better options on your bench. I don't care uh, what the contract status is. I don't care what the trade value was. I don't care where they were picked at. You have better options than Gordon Hayward. And I want to circle back with, I stand by this was a good trade because again, you didn't lose anything in the trade. And if you can somehow get Gordon Hayward to click, this is what the most head scratching part of this all is. The thing you're waiting to come around is the thing you've seen him be best at throughout a 16 year sample size. So would it surprise you if Gordon Hayward and these next six, six games has a come to Jesus moment and, and he gets in the locker room and sings Kumbaya with his teammates. And all of a sudden now he's being ultra aggressive and he's hitting shots. Ultra aggressive within the realm of, of what he's asked to do. Certainly not. That, that would not st stun you because we've seen the former all-star do that at every stop in his career. But with the context of having a seven week delay in the season where, where he's just not playing for seven weeks due to a calf injury, then having to try to integrate into a new team, this has not looked good. And if there was ever a night for you to spark something offensively, it was these previous two nights where there's no stepping on anyone's toes. You look at Chad Holmgren, who, who I thought uh, showed a lot of flashes these last two days. You're not stepping on his toes by, by going and getting your shot because he's more of a play finisher uh, than a play creator. We'll talk more about that coming up. And, you know, Josh Giddy couldn't do it alone. Like, he needed the help out there as well. So there was no one to, um, you know, acquiesce to. And yet Gordon Hayward still just could not go out there and, and find his shot. And it's not as simple as that. And, and I know that this is going to be something that uh, – internally, they're not saying to Gordon Hayward, or they're, not, they're not kind of maybe even agreeing with because, uh, you know, they grade the shots and they, and they look at it through different understandings of what they were trying to accomplish. But from the outside looking in, like this was not good and has not been good from Gordon Hayward. So, you know, it's been a lovely cruise to this point, but the ship's sailing pretty well and, and coasting in the dock. We're, we're about to be off the Gordon Hayward Express, the Gordon Hayward uh, CC or whatever ships are called nowadays. So it was a low risk, high reward move, but you got no reward from it to this point. And I, and I don't foresee, uh, the, the reward coming. I really don't, but that's the benefit of having these next six games. I just will stand by number one. The trade was well thought out and, and, and I'm still to this day fine with it being executed. Number two, in a, in a vacuum of, of the ideal world, I totally see where Gordon Hayward helps this team. 
Absolutely see it. That's why he was one of my favorite tra trade targets pre-deadline and why I really like the trade post-deadline. But also number three, while he's an ideal fit on paper, it's just not working. And we can acknowledge that it's not working. I would even agree with giving him minutes still in these, in these last six games, but certainly not the playoffs if it looks like this. But he's a veteran. He's been around the block. He's been on teams that, that were young and aspiring to be contenders. Uh, he, he's a great voice in the room if he's being uh, a vocal leader behind the scenes. And it wouldn't shock me in the totality of his career if he has a good offensive explosion uh, in the next six weeks and gets you know ramped up for the playoffs. But there's nothing to suggest that that will happen. Whereas on the other hand, we have a mountain of evidence that Aaron Wiggins and the players we rattled off before will be better than him and produce more than him and give you a better impact than him in the postseason, this iteration of him. But we'll see how it all plays out. We'll be here to cover it all on the Lockdown Thunder podcast. Coming up, let's talk Chet Holmgren. Let's talk Josh Kitty and more. But first, I want to tell you right now about our good friends over at Amazon Fire TV. Check them out today at Amazon Fire TV because they're great. And you're going to want to check them out because uh, they have everything for your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers you amazing viewing experiences with the smart TVs as well as Fire TV sticks, which you can plug into your existing television to provide you access to millions of movies and TV episodes all for free, as well as live TV. Whether you are uh, in, it, in for it for opening weekend of baseball or the college basketball tournaments or you just want to have a Fire TV, check out Fire TV because recently Fire TV channels uh, have, has kind of created this channel uh, to deliver you a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Uh, Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, and the NBA. Uh, and a lot more throughout sports as well, including Major League Baseball. So not to mention the great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on the Fire TV app and the Alexa, dev and Alexa devices. If you haven't already, you should by visiting amazon.com slash lockdown fire TV. That's amazon.com slash lockdown fire TV. Also want to say right now about our good friends. Over at FanDuel. Check them out today at FanDuel.com slash lockdown. That's FanDuel.com slash lockdown because new customers get $200 in bonus bets with the winning of any $5 bet. That's 200 bucks if you're bet uh, in a tournament or MLB or NBA or NHL and so much more hits. Check it out today uh, at FanDuel.com slash lockdown. FanDuel.com slash lockdown to get you that $5 bet and win big if that bet hits. FanDuel's the America's number one sports book. Uh, and if you only want to bet on the, the NBA because that's what you feel most uh, intimate with and what you feel most knowledgeable about, there's a lot of good action to, to place your bets on today, including the Mavericks taking on the Hawks. The Mavericks are an 11 and a half point favorite at home for as streaky as they've been. That's pretty interesting. The Rockets, four and a half point uh, underdogs at home to the Golden State Warriors and the Nuggets. This is a, this is a good one. If you listen to this podcast before the line changes, Minus three and a half for the Nuggets on the road. Whenever the whenever the Clippers will not have Kawhi, I would jump on that uh, if I were you at fanduelcom slash lockdown. fanduelcom slash lockdown. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Let me know down below on YouTube or on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles what you think the Thunder should do with Gordon Hayward's minutes. Well, let's dive into trash Giddy. I think that Josh Kitty just loves playing in places that are called the garden, TD garden, Madison square garden, the, your backyard garden, whatever it is, Josh Giddy will play well in that environment. 17 points, two rebounds, six assists and 63% from the floor, including one for two from three. Uh, I, I think that Josh Giddy has legitimately turned a corner. And part of it is because of how well he turns the actual corners in these games. Considering how good the rim protection you know, threat is from Boston, I thought that this was one of his better games uh, and, and a better game in the sense of uh, continuing to persuade you that this is not a hot stretch in March. This is not, uh, you know, just a random streak. This is stuff that he's really learned and figured out through the course of his young career. 
Like we forget that uh, this is the part where you are learning and you are growing. And it's not always going to look like, like Jade up, right? Where Jade Up's just never really had a stretch where he struggled. And he's never really had a stretch where uh, he struggled to a dramatic degree. And it's been an upward trajectory uh, the entire way. Some players do have to ride the roller coaster a little bit, and they do have to adjust, and they do have to uh, experience ups and downs. And Josh Giddy took his lumps for the majority of this season. But I think that the Thunder sticking with him allowed him to, to understand how to play in this role. And the way that he's using his body just pops off the page. He And, and not just his own body, but understanding how to use screens how to allow the screen setter to get set, uh, how to attack and time it whenever you're coming off the screen with the patience, but also the burst that you need uh, to get by in a hurry before the, the other team can switch. And so you watch him with these DHOs with Jalen Williams and, and uh, a screen that it was, I believe, from Chet that allowed uh, Josh Giddy to, to blow by Jalen Brown to get to the rim. And no offense to Josh Giddy, but if they're one-on-one -on -one isolated, he's not going to blow by Jalen Brown. But his understanding of what it takes to benefit from a screen has gotten so much better um, this season. That's really helped him because if you can get him a step on somebody, whether you're generating that from a DHO or you're generating that from a screen or you're generating that from a cut, you know, in transition or in transition, wherever, if you can just get him simply a step on somebody, his six foot eight frame is going to do the rest because he's putting together how to use that frame to his advantage, how to twist his shoulder in and, 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 and shield off a defender from the ball, how to get leverage and, and, and benefit himself to finish, you know, with a shot, with a shot blocker in front of him and how to punish small guards. There were some really good drives on, you know, Derek white who's a great defender, you know, great defender. Uh, but Josh Giddy used his size to his advantage. And that floater coming around is such a great weapon for him as well, just in the totality of this stretch. I think that this has been the best stretch of his career. I think that what's been the, the swing skill is what we've talked about since August in FIBA. It's been finishing inside the arc. He's doing it at a high clip in the mid-range, in the paint, at the rim. This has been his best rim scoring month. And so when you're looking at this stretch, I don't know what else he has to do to get you to buy in. Because while he's improved offensively, he's been stellar defensively for his role. Again, he's not going to be a Lou Dort. He's not going to be a, a guy who you write letters to Ma back home about on the defensive end. He's not going to garner defensive player of the year votes or all defensive team votes. But he can certainly... Stick in front of his man, deflect passes, and get this team out running in transition. And he does that consistently when he's actually engaged defensively. He's been engaged all month long, and he's been able to uh, you know, bear the fruits of his labor, so to say. And then offensively, you know, I think that what's been the most encouraging part is you can tell who's not truly watching this Josh Giddy uh, explosion by uh, the, the people who ask the question, you know, what happens when the shots aren't falling or caveat it with, obviously the shots are falling right now, still to this day. Because he did obviously have some fluke nights from three, you know, four for six in Milwaukee, five for eight in uh, New Orleans. But, you know, dating back to uh, March 3rd, Here's has been his three point makes two, one, 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 two, one, 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 four, five, zero, one, two, zero. And he's been playing spectacular during that stretch. He's had two outlier three games, which certainly helped him to score, you know, uh, the, the 25 points that he scored in New Orleans. But it has not been what's he, what he's been counting on. It's not been what he's been relying on. He's been relying on stuff that as a 6'8 guard who claims he's 6'9, he can do over 
and over and over again. And he's done it whenever SGA is in the lineup. And I think that people don't even realize that when SGA is in the lineup, it's going to look even better, I believe. Because then you're forced to put a small guard on him. And he's finally put together how to capitalize in that matchup. He's also gotten to that floater and gotten to that to that you know elbow jumper a lot recently, which if you do want to have a guard, I'm sorry, a big play dramatically off him underneath the ring, he'll make you pay there. And you and you're gonna pay a little bit more respect to him on those drives with your secondary players to where then it opens up a lane for him to pass off of. I think that you saw him in New Orleans, which again, this part, this part you can say like, hey, let's wait to see. In New Orleans, he didn't play Valentinus off the court, uh, but he did also hit that outlier number of threes. So we'll see there. But you look um, and and kind of see what he did against uh, Milwaukee was the same way of just hitting those threes that were wide open whenever a uh, big man was on him. But against New, against uh, Phoenix, whenever he's used of Nurkic on him, you know, for whatever time period that they want to put him on, on, on Giddy, he did. He also was played off the floor. Giddy went one for three from three. He didn't rely on the three point ball uh, to to get uh, Nurkic off the court in that setting either. So I, I think that this is all a legit stretch. And again, is it going to be the thirty point per game? You know, it's going to be the thirty point triple double in the Garden. No, that's not going to be that every single night. Uh, but I think that he can be a positive player for you uh, and a really good starter for you if he can play this way, which I think he can. Let's talk Lou Dort. I thought that even for the context of what the Thunder were going through, Lou Dort was rushed and had a control and took some bad shots. I think that this was a night where you know, Dort's been very open uh, about his previous bad shot selection. I think this is a night where he would, as he would put it, go back and watch the shots and say, oh, I, I was taking some wild shots. And I think that the biggest thing for, for this game that you saw was that this roster, I think, uh, would benefit from another guard, as much as that is taboo to say, considering uh, how people just want to clamor for a big man. I think their style of play, it was extremely winnable. The, the last two, these last game from Philadelphia, this game, of course, Boston's the best team in the NBA. So like this game, it was a lost cause from the beginning uh, without Shea and Jada, but it, what certainly did not help matters was the fact that the Thunder could not create space if they were in the Milky Way tonight uh, and could not set their guys up and, and, and use their guys in their designed roles as play finishers. Uh, another guard could help do that. For Lou Dort, he's got to find the balance of like, yeah, Jada and Shea are not with the Thunder right now. They're not playing, but you've still got to play uh, your game. You cannot let that get you outside your element. What, what I will say to defend Lou Dort, though, is in this setting, somebody has to go try to score. Like in this setting, somebody has to be the one to take shots. And he's shown you that he's going to be the one to take shots if no one else is going to step up. So you've got to f- flush out that depth of guys who will allow Ludor to keep playing his game, even whenever you, you suffer some injuries. Coming up, let's talk Isaiah Joe. Let's talk Chet Holmgren and how the Thunder looked in this game against Boston. But first, I want to say right now about our good friends over at Robin Hood. That's right, Robin Hood. Folks, Robin Hood, did you know that if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA program that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar that you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar that you transfer from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most out of your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. The offer is good through April 30th. Get started today at Robinhood.com slash boost and subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claims as of Q1 2024, valid by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. 
must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% match to transfer it is subject to terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA is available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. We're back on the Lockdown Theater Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your teams every day. Folks, check out the Lockdown Sports Today uh, YouTube channel, 24-7 streaming channel of all the national stories that's happening around the NBA, MLB, NFL, college sports, everything you need right there for you. Shout out Isaiah Joe. He looks back, hit that step back three, finish through contact very well, uh, cut so well to create advantages for the Thunder, and you can see teams respecting him at all three levels. Even blocked another jump shooter, got a steal, 13 points, three boards. Uh, I think that Isaiah Joe will be a swing player in the playoffs. Like, And he will be a player who you talk about. Like, like every year when teams have big postseason runs or pull off upsets or just simply uh, maximize their season, to do that, it takes just this player who is on the margins nationally that all of a sudden is popping and, and has this arrival. Isaiah Joe is such a good shooter that now has expanded into an, an offensive weapon for you as a cutter who, who guys are being alert for when he cuts through the lane and has shown you some playmaking chops off the dribble that offensively, if he's getting it going, it changes the game. And defensively, you cannot play him off the court. He plays bigger than he is. Even in a pick and roll heavy playoff format where you know you try to exploit mismatches, I don't believe Isaiah Joe can get played off the court. So if you can go and get like three just unbelievable Isaiah Joe three point nights and a couple random, you know, a couple just solid, you know, state of the mill three point nights from Isaiah Joe, it really changes your ceiling in a hurry. And so as he scuttled in March a little bit, as he did last March. I still remained calm about his his kind of overall outlook, and he looked good the last two nights with double-digit points off the bench. I, I think that Chet Holmgren, just like he did against Philadelphia, showed flashes, like really nice flashes. Bumping KP with his shoulder to score off the catch, uh, a nice post finish, and fired a couple threes. And you wanted to shoot more threes, even if you miss. He went over three tonight. Uh, 11 points, seven boards, two assists, one turnover. I saw some some people criticizing the fact that like um, he 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 needed Shea and Jadub. It's like yeah, like he's a big man. What did you want him to do? Like like Chet Holmgren is going to be this almighty play finisher and two way impact guy that has some shot creation pop. He's not a creator with some play finishing. So in these games without Shea and Jadub, that formula to make him successful and to make him the, the top 1% guy that we thought, you know, of his going back to his pre-draft stock, like to make him that version of himself, this formula is backwards without Shea and Jadub. It's why they complement each other so well. Of course, he's not going to be able to, to, you know, create a ton of offense by himself, especially with, uh, you know, the, the variations of lineups around them without Shea and Jadub. But in the grand scheme of things, this game you know, meant nothing because you care way more about the health of Shea and J-Dub than you do winning this game uh, or even your playoff seating. We'll talk, we'll have an entire segment or maybe even two about playoff seating uh, coming later today. Uh, but nonetheless, the Thunder did not have the necessary depth to win this game against Boston. Credit to Boston, uh, who, who kept the Thunder at arm's length all night, including including during a great third quarter punch from Oklahoma City, which, you know, despite winning 60 games, you know, Boston has teetered a little bit recently in, in blowing big leads and, and to sleeping on opponents who may not have their A game. Uh, so credit to them. They, they did really well. Two lead changes, four ties. It, it comes down to this. The Thunder shot 20% from three. Uh, you know, if, you, if you were underneath the basket tonight uh, in Boston, you were in danger of being concussed at the very least uh, whenever the Thunder were shooting threes. 43-20-89 for OKC. Boston shot 40, uh, you know, 54, 42, 94, and I don't think that the Thunder had bad looks. I thought the Thunder got some quality looks. They just didn't hit them, uh, and then eventually things unraveled for them. 
Boston one points in the paint, second chance points, and fast break points, things that are normally OKC's way, two of those three are usually. Uh, the Thunder had more turnovers, another thing that's usually OKC's way, and the Thunder lost the rebounding battle 46 to 31. So it, it was not a good night uh, from Oklahoma City in terms of production. I think that there are still some value in these games uh, due to the, the repetition you can get guys in different roles uh, who normally don't get to play that way. Uh, but the biggest takeaway from this night was really about Gordon Hayward. And, and I, I'm interested to see how it goes in the next six games. But there will be serious conversations had about the postseason with Gordon Hayward when the time comes. Speaking of, let me just run through the schedule unlocked on Thunder and get you excited. So you should please subscribe on YouTube and any other co- podcasting platform that you have. So coming up, we're going to have should the Thunder want the three seed and your mailbag questions. So there's still time to drop in your, your mailbag questions down below. Then we're going to have a special guest on the pod who you're not going to want to miss. Then we're going to have the Pacers recap, the Hornets recap, another guest, the Kings recap, the Spurs recap, Stockwatch heading into the playoffs. The Bucks recap, the Mavs recap, that's 10 days, you know, that's 10 pods in 11 days. But get this, if you think that was crazy, if you think 10 pods in 11 days is crazy, we're going to do a postseason dash. That is a pod every single day and twice on game days. A podcast every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and twice on game days. You're going to get your normal podcast on game days. You're going to get your uh, game preview on game days where we go through the keys to the game for the upcoming night. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be something that you should want to stick around for uh, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast from, including on YouTube. Let me know what you think about the Celtics game without J-Dub, without Shea. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.